Good evening, folks. You're very welcome to another episode of The Changing Room by EJ Mendor. I'm absolutely delighted to say that we have one of the greatest goalkeepers uh, in League of Ireland history, I think it's fair to say, online. Uh, Gary Rogers is with us. Gary, thanks very much for agreeing to come on this evening. Thanks very much, Mark. How could I not agree with a build-up like that? You have to give me a great start. Yeah. <laughs> You're used to the pressure. You performed well under pressure. I've watched you, I've watched you oh, many look. times live in the showgrounds over the years, so I know you're able for it. No, it was a great, great place to play. Um, I loved, loved it in, in the showgrounds. Great time, I suppose, in my career. I suppose, look, you get remembered for Dundalk, but like, Sligo was brilliant, brilliant as well. There's some great, uh, great days in there. Yeah, I suppose when you kind of... I wouldn't say came on the scene. You you were on the scene for a few years, and I think kind of around the time of St. Pat's, you had probably prepared yourselves to being recognised as one of the, the best keepers in the league. I certainly remember when you signed for Sligo Rovers and everybody fully believing that we had just acquired the best keeper in the league. And I think that that kind of stood for itself that season. I don't remember how many clean sheets exactly, but I know there, there was a few. That was a, a brilliant time in your career. It was a brilliant thing, Gary. Yeah, I think you know that when I moved from from St Pat's to Sligo, um, look, it, it was about winning the league. I'd been in the league, like you say, for a good while at that stage, and and I felt that the Sligo team the year before that finished second was probably a team that was good enough to win the league. And Paul Cook was signing, um, like he signed himself, he signed uh, Danny North, Mark Quigley, uh, Robert Bocco, Ross Gaynor, and he added players like that. And there was more there as well. To the, to the squad he already had and I just felt it was a great opportunity to go and win the league and because I hadn't won one at that stage and, and it, like I was knocking around for a while like you say yourself and uh, I just felt it was a great great chance to go and and, and try and win, pick up that league title and uh, obviously Cookie Cookie did what he did and he left I remember I remember I remember turning up the train in one morning and all I could see was Cookie driving the opposite way and go what's going on here uh, off the act in the Stanley I don't think I've seen him since yeah certainly I remember I remember hearing the news that uh, that Cookie was leaving and, and it was absolutely devastating because as you said we kind of felt we had a team good enough to win the league the year before and we kind of thought we were moving on to that year where the league was going to be ours we thought every, everything was falling down and I suppose I wanted to touch on Stephen Kenny later in the show, but the man who came in to replace uh, Paul Cook is now the current Northern Irish manager, uh, Ian Barraclough. What was Ian like to work for or work with? Yeah, he was he was brilliant. I think you know it often gets forgotten how good a job Ian did. Like you know when you think about, it, I think it was um, we were landed or he was landed with you know a bunch of players. I think a week or ten days before the start of the season. So like that in itself is a daunting task. Although look. It was a great group of players would like to come in and have to, you know, hit the ground running with a team that was, you know, really expected to go and win the league or certainly challenge. Um, you know, Ian, Ian did a great job and, and came in and, and was excellent. And so look, he, he won a trophy every season for the three years he was there. And I, look, I really enjoyed working working uh, with him, so to say. And uh, it was, look, it was fantastic. I think probably the one thing we probably left behind the the, the league in 2013 after the great start we had we had a bit of a, a shaky spell I'd say in the middle in the round Europe and, and look we I think we had eight or nine or ten wins I think at the start of the season and people were saying oh we, we look you win it at a canter but that's just not the way the way it happens uh, you need to be winning them eight or nine ten games in a row at the end of the season and it worked out very differently so but uh, um look we, we picked up the FAI Cup that year but look working with working with uh what Ian was, was 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 really good and, and like it was like I said it was great times and uh... yeah I I spoke to uh, over the last lockdown I spoke with with Conor O'Grady Gavin Pears uh, Kano and I kind of I, I spoke to them about certainly Kano and Piersy uh, about Barra and they, what they said is that he probably didn't get the credit he deserved with regards that maybe games that they would have lost the year before they, they managed to get the draw and they managed to get over the line with uh, under Barraclough was it his attention to detail um, I wouldn't use negative as a word but he was very tactically aware of what was going on would that be fair to say yeah he's very tactically aware and then I think you know even on the training ground I think when it came to training I, I, I don't know what it was like obviously before cooking but I, like I hear stories of lads going for bacon sandwiches before cook semi-finals and all that sort of stuff more than bacon sandwiches Gary yeah I know and <laughs> There was, there, there was certainly a tightening up in the regime when, when Ian came along. Um, but having said that, like it worked out pretty well before that, and it, like you can win stuff all different ways. But uh, yeah, like it, like his, it, I suppose the work he did in the training grounds, you know, was excellent as well. And uh, 
like but it, it, as well as like there was some fantastic players there too and and um like it, it was really enjoyable i suppose spell at the club and um you know to be competing every year and 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 to be picking up silverware it was, it was brilliant but like like say like and Ian's gone on now to obviously he went to, to Motherwell and he was he was in the, he was in Oldham as well in England and now he's he's Northern Ireland manager so it, it's you know it's brilliant to see yeah, him progress in his career as well. It wasn't always enjoyable. I uh, I won't reveal any sources, but I was told today there was a couple of uh, shaky moments in Dublin Airport heading for Rosenberg uh, <laughs> doing a lot of passports. <laughs> you nearly didn't get in the plane to play, to play Rosenberg, was it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't, there was ructions at the airport that time. I think everyone was giving me a wide berth. Um, I, I like I, I I'm sure I, your sources have you well informed there. <laughs> but uh, there, was, there was a serious issue on the way to Rosenborg with my passport. Um, I think uh, I it, it went back to the say that we played Banga at home. Yeah. And we had to bring a we had to bring a passport to train or to the game for UA for whatever it was. So I gave I gave him my passport. I gave it to Theo, and he looked after. It. Went out and did the warm up and taught nothing of it. Um. Trained that we, we played the game, we we won, that was grand. Um, and then we're going out to Rosenberg, and I just presumed that the club had me passport because when I was at Pats, the club would take your passport and hold on to it, and then you get it in the airport, so no one would leave it behind. So because I hadn't been given back my passport, I thought, well, that was grand. So I'm on the bus and I'm I'm kind of a bit anxious. I said, if you see a few lads with passports knocking ready to go. Where'd you get your passport? I said, I said, I had it. And I go, oh, I don't have mine. I said, she said, oh, you're joking. I said, I don't. I said, I gave it to Theo and uh, I don't have it. I said, I presume the club have it. And he, and I said to Paul Hines, he was the general manager at the time. I said, Paul, have you got my passport? And he goes, no. And he knew nothing about it. And he knew by his face straight away he didn't have it. But as it turned out, we got into the airport and Theo informed me that me pass, that he put me passport in me bag in the dressing room that day in 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 the in the last round against Banger. And I and never told me like and I go, you need to tell me you put me passport in the bag and you never thought to say it to me. And I I I had two bags. I used to bring one bag to the away trip because it was clean and the other one that I had knocking around the home. So me but my passport was my passport was left in the in the house of Sligo. So I went bananas in the airport and was fuming. So, <laughs> We we kind of got it sorted. Um, Piers's dad worked up there, and he like Piers's dad hadn't a lot to learn. To be fair to him, he he knew. He said if you go down to the guard station there and tell him you lost the passport in the airport, um, you know, but you have to say that you had it in the airport. You tell him you lost it in the airport, they'll give you a letter. And if the because we were charting the plane, the the um the the, the flight crew would let you on the plane, but you had to square it off with the authorities in Norway. So. I went down to the guard station, got me letter, and um, our charter flight would have let me on, and they notified the crowd in Norway. So they all knew me when I got to Norway with my piece of paper and no passport. So. <laughs> but uh, yeah, all glamour. That, that was that, that was that was some that was some crack. <laughs> I'd say you were some sight in the airport. <laughs> oh, I was, I was fuming, fuming. Uh, we blame Theo for that one. Um, I yeah, suppose... well, Theo, Theo's still not talking to me over it. <laughs> Theo is still not talking. He doesn't hold the grudge in fairness to him. You must have really given it to him at the airport. <laughs> I don't know. He's afraid of that. Um, not mad he is afraid of I suppose just on a more on a more serious note, Gary, uh, the last couple of days, obviously the stories come out about extra funding from the FEI for the, the, the year ahead and increased prize money for, for finishes in the league and that. I suppose the question I'm trying to ask is, was, is it enough to sustain maybe the league going forward this year, obviously the lack of crowds. I know kind of Dundalk and Stiger Rovers may they kind of have a different a different setup, but you know you're from your time with Stiger Rovers, the amount of work the the trust do, um it, it's a real, real it's a, it's the town's club. Um and we rely a lot on the supporters and door to door and and match the how do you think it's going to be affected this year and is the funding going to be enough? Um look I think it's probably even with the increase in prize money, the funding that on its own is probably not going to be enough. It's, there is certainly going to be government funding required in order to, I suppose, see out the full season like it was last year. And the government are going to have to kind of play a big part in that. And like what you say about Sligo over supporters, like the one thing I would take away from my time at Sligo is how much the club 
I suppose means to the people of Sligo and and the wider community. It's like like I really enjoyed it down there. I, I was made feel very welcome, and the people of Sligo look are, are brilliant. Like and, and I think anybody, I suppose, it's testament uh, to the people of Sligo down there. How many players actually make it their home? And stay there after their career, and the, like there's loads of examples of that where lads, are, you know, they've gone to Sligo and, and they've never left it. So I don't know what you're doing down there. I did well to get out of there. But um, it's EJ Mendes it, the close. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, no, I've been in there a few it, times. That EJ's looked after me. To be fair. Yeah, no, I know you're still. In fairness, anyone I chatted to today, you're you're spoken of so fondly down down in Sligo. I think. The only people that had bad words to say about you was a couple of the the groundskeepers in the golf clubs that reckon they're still uh, they're still <laughs> working on the courses after you were out, but we won't get into that. Is there any is there any player from your time at Sligo Rovers that kind of stands out to you? I know it was an unbelievable team, and so much was made of the attacking talent. The defense was unreal as well. Any player that stands out to me as your time as just was the best. Yeah, look, it, it's hard to kind of say who was the best. I think, you know, probably one that gets forgotten about, um, like, is Raf Kataro. Because I think, you know, Raf was a tremendous player, like, yeah. for 20 years in the league. And he was, he was brilliant, like, a brilliant servant to the club. I think he often kind of gets forgotten about a little bit because he's a local lad. And, and sometimes we don't probably think enough of our local players where, you know, like, Joseph Doe is an incredible player. Uh, and and there's loads of good examples of, of, of top class players, but like I think you know Raf for um, like his longevity and his quality, and like I I would have made me debut and Raf was playing for uh, for Sligo, and I think it was his debut season as well. And you look at him, I, I think he's probably the best player ever I've seen in the league to jump for a ball, like oh, for yeah. the size of him, the leap. like the the leap he can get. Like he we used to target him for kickouts, like yeah. he's that good. And no matter who would be up against, like he. Like he was a terrific player, and it, it, like not just his ability, his work rate, and um, and his quality. Like it, it, he was, um, like Raf would certainly be up there. With, you know, one of the best Rovers players, I think. And how intelligent was he? I mean, I seen Raf over the years. I seen him play right full. I seen him play right wing. I seen him play outside left. I seen him play in the number ten, and I seen him play up front. And I I never seen him. I'm going to say never seen him play a bad game. Obviously, every player is bad yeah. games, but. He was brilliant in every position. Any position he wanted to play, he was effective in. I think that tells you probably a lot about him. And another thing that, you know, playing in all of them positions, you often get a player who's a centre-back and you'd be asked to play right back and he'd be, he'd be throwing a strop because he doesn't want to be out there. You'd never get that from Raf. Raf's attitude was top class. No matter where you'd put him, he'd give 100% and, he, and he'd do a really good job for you. So, look, it, it speaks volumes that he could play in so many positions. He'd probably give it a go in goals as well, to be fair. Yeah, <laughs> he'd be well able to leap up to the top corner as well. Uh, Gary, that's great. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back. We're going to touch on the Dundalk days and with Stephen Kenny. No problem. Here's Gary. EJmenswear.com, the half price sale now on. Shop half price Calvin Klein, Tommy Hilfiger, Farah. EJmenswear.com, shop half price Ralph Lauren, Ted Smith, Gant. EJmenswear.com, shop half price Lionel Scott, G Star, Super Dry. Shop half price Top Browns, shop Irish owned, shop EJmenswear.com. Shop the half price sale now at EJmenswear.com. How's things, folks? Welcome back to part two of the changing room with Gary Rogers. Uh, Gary, just to move on to, to the Dundalk days. Uh, certainly when it rains it pours with you in terms of trophies we spoke about how when you won your first league and you came to Sligo it certainly wasn't your last as when you moved on to the dock you had a an era of kind of dominance you, you would say some great battles with, with Cork and others um, league titles FEI Cups were were at hand um, talk to me about the days in Dundalk um, I look it, it was a brilliant I suppose opportunity I was uh, at the time obviously I, I was three years at Sligo and then I was Really, the opportunity to go to Dundalk when Stephen rang me, um, and I was moving home, and and it kind of worked out really well for me that you know Stephen gave me the opportunity to join the club. They were after winning the league and the Champions League football to look forward to. It was just one that like I really you couldn't refuse. And um, yeah, like, like before season two thousand fifteen, like that two thousand fifteen team, I thought was probably you know probably one of the best teams of, of the kind of. The whole kind of period I was there, you look at you Daryl Horgan and Richie Terrell and, and Andy Boyle and Gartland and all the kind of lads that you're familiar with, like yeah. Gannon and you know, all these guys that were like Steve, Stevie O'Donnell, all these Chris Shields are all there. Like that, that 2015 team was probably, I think, the nearly the best team of the whole kind mm. of, I suppose, era, if you like. Um, 
and um, like you know, to go and win a double in your first season, it just doesn't come much better than that. And um, we were fortunate that year in in Europe as well. We played badly by ourselves, and we I think we we got, we got beat two one over there, and we drew nil all at home, where one nil would have would have taken us through. But that was the kind of um, to set the tone for the following year, where where we um, we beat them uh, over the two legs and got through to the group stages. So it was a great couple of years uh, to start off with, and, and and like I think you know Stephen's um, attitude and, and what he demanded of the team helped us kind of prolong that kind of period of success. Any player I've heard uh, speak about Stephen Kenny. Um, has always said how honest he is. You always know where you stand with him. What's he like to work with on a daily basis? Yeah, I think look on a daily basis. You see, it's Stephen's skill, I suppose, is his uh, his management of players and individuals, and and like you you know yourself, like everybody is different, and everybody has different kind of needs and wants, and and Stephen is able to kind of probably identify. Um, how to get the best out of each player individually uh, and in order to get the collective kind of uh, results, you know, and Stephen was was brilliant at that. Like, it wasn't so much like the stuff that you would do in the training ground, although there was the great stuff done on the training ground, but it was, you know, that X factor is, if you like, the skill in, in managing the, the group and, and I suppose making everyone work off the, like, I suppose a great skill of his is that even if lads weren't in the team, they were still pulling in the same direction and everyone was kind of together on it as opposed to, you know, we would, sometimes you would have dressing rooms and you'd have three or four lads that wouldn't be that happy and they might drag another two or three into that group or whatever it may be. Um, but Stephen was brilliant at keeping everyone going in the same direction. I think that really helped us, um, our, our success over that period. Would you say you kind of reacted better to, let's say, management like Stephen? He, he obviously he's a calm character. Um, obviously, man management is such a big part of it. Would you consider it maybe a bigger part of management than the tactical side of it, or is it just about finding the right balance? I look, there's bits. Of, it, it, there is certainly a balance to it. I think you know you could probably with with our team, I suppose at, at certain periods you could probably pick you know the four three three that it would play, but it, with the intensity that we used to play it, like you know knowing the players that are going to be on the pitch is one thing, but um, being able to match the work rate and the intensity, I think you know. Certainly, I know it was when I went to Dundalk, you know, the intensity of training and, um, and but the physical condition of the players, and it was very much like that you had to get on board with that and reach them levels if you wanted to be there. And, and look, it's something that I probably focus more on it later in my career that I probably didn't have enough focus on early in my career was the strength and condition side of things and, you know, diet and nutrition. Not that it was ever a kind of abusing myself, but just kind of fine tuning in order to try and get that that little extra bit out of your career like and the fact that we were winning things they give you that more hunger and desire to kind of keep making them sacrifices in order to be successful and uh, I suppose when you add it all together it, it was a, a kind of winning recipe Yeah and successful you certainly were over the course of the, of the couple of seasons um, I think a lot of the, the teams uh, for example yourselves um, I suppose Shamrock Rovers will be in the next year or two are kind of judged on, on European performances as well um, have you had time to kind of reflect since you've retired with regards to the European? The are you, Obviously, you're proud of the achievements. Do you look back at it as a, on it as a great achievement or is the professional in you still looking back on maybe opportunities missed? Um, I think look, I think there's probably opportunities missed this year um, in terms of our results. I think 2016, I suppose, look, we were in with a chance of qualifying out of the group right up until the last game. So I suppose it's not so much an opportunity miss on, on that kind of thing. But I think this year there was probably an opportunity. Look, Arsenal aside, I think we were more than capable of taking points off, off the other two teams and we were competitive in, in, in all the games. But it, it was hugely difficult, um, you know, with, with the amount of games we had and the rotation in the squad. It was kind of, it, it was stacked against it. Like, you know, you think about the first game against Mola where we were 1-0 up after with 55, 60 minutes gone in the game. And if you look back on that, we were the only team that played in the Europa League that week on the Thursday that had a game on the Monday night as well. So, like, I think whatever, whatever chance a League of Ireland team has of progressing, um, you need everything to be going in your favour. And, you know, playing a game, whether five, like maybe five, six, seven players were involved in that game that were that played in the Molde game. But you need that kind of preparation in order to focus on 
on the opposition because you do need that week to focus on a team that you haven't played before and you need to look in, in detail on what they do and what we're going to do to counteract it. And I think there's probably an opportunity missed maybe this season to, to maybe even get out of the group. Um, but look, having said that, you're up against top quality opposition. But I think we showed that we're more than capable at times um, you know, to compete with that level of op uh, opposition as well. And where do you think uh, the league needs to go, Gary, in terms of, I asked Jack Byrne this last week, uh, it's always a great achievement when we obviously we've seen Dundalk into the group stages last year and it's always, it is a brilliant achievement. Where does the league have to get to to where a team is doing that every year? That it's not seen as an achievement, the next stage is constantly getting to the group stages. How do we develop that and, and get teams, more teams into that? Yeah, I think you've got to look at, um, it's not just the top teams, you've got to look at the whole, the league as a whole and develop all the teams in the league and, and whether it depends on what way they fund it, but you need a full-time league. And at the minute we have, you know, when you take the first division into consideration, you have amateur teams, you have semi-professional um, and you have professional teams all playing in elite football in this country. And I suppose until we get to the stage, and I know it's difficult and there's huge funding needed, until we get to the stage where our league is fully professional, whether it's the, it's the Premier Division or both divisions where it's fully professional and it is an industry here, we probably can't really expect you know, to be to be in group stages every year. Now, it's been great in the last 10, 12 years, 10, 11, 12 years, whatever it is, that we've had three teams qualify for the group stages. And, and that's, been, that's been brilliant. But I think, you know, a lot of the time, the quality of players in our league probably gets overlooked because we're playing in our league and we don't have the nice fancy grounds around. Uh, and, you know, probably sometimes it doesn't look the part on the TV depending on where you're playing. But there's huge quality in, in, in the dressing rooms all over the country. And there's, there's really good players in our league and there's good young players coming through. And I think with the academy structures that are in place now with clubs, you know, the, the opportunity now is to nurture that talent and to bring it through into the first team. And I do think it's more beneficial for young players in, in this country to be playing adult, senior adult football as opposed to playing maybe under 18 or academy football in the UK. You're playing real football here, um, senior level, and I think that will be good for the development of, of players in the league. Whether they go on to the UK or Europe or somewhere else, that's, that, that's fine. And like you want lads to get the best out of their career and reach their potential. But like there, is, there is really good talent, talent in the league as well. Would you worry about the standard of the league possibly slipping in the next season or two? A lot has been made about Brexit and how maybe some of the, the championship or, or League One or whatever it is may struggle a bit more to bring in uh, players from Europe and that maybe the Irish the Irish League might be might be a target. Obviously, uh, Danny Grant ha has left Bohemians. Uh, we heard Aaron McAniff has moved yesterday. Jack Byrne is gone. Would you worry about the standard slipping in the next couple of years or is it just a cycle that we've got used to over the next few years? And you can see things changing, but like the opportunity of the academies to come through and young players to get to get football should help them. So you would like to think that that will make them players better and stronger. Like it's always the case that your top players in the in the league will go. Like I think you know, when I, during my time at the you know Richie Tell went, and then you had Pat Pat Hoven went first. Richie Tell went, Daryl Horgan went, Andy Boy went, Patrick McElhenney went. The top player in the league, Shawnee McGuire, the following year top two or three players in the league nearly move on every year so it, it, it's something that you know it, that we're used to it, not that we're a, a kind of a feeder league for the UK but you know the top talent will will move because of you know the, the I suppose the level of, of wages that there are in this country and it's easy for for teams to cherry pick the best talent and and they're probably getting a hell of a player for for their money in terms of you know the they won't have to pay massive fees in order to, to get the players over as well. So, like, you know, it's, it's, that has been the kind of norm over the last number of years. And it probably Kevin Doyle probably led the way in that uh, in 2000, I think, one or two, whenever, whenever Kevin went. So, like, it's just, it's just the nature of, of the business here. Um, but like I, I don't see that changing dramatically. Whereas, you know, anyone who's performing really well here, the spotlight is going to be on them. And, and clubs are going to be interested, and um, and that's just the way it is. But you, there's always lads coming along to replace them as well. Like you, when I say about the players that have gone, there's been lads to come along and replace them, and have gone maybe a year or two later as well. So like that, that's just the, the nature of the business. Yeah, absolutely. I think I've uh, I've grinned enough for one night, Gary. Uh, just before you finish uh, on retirement, what's the next step for yourself? I see you're you're going back into coaching within the GAA. 
Yeah, I'm doing a little bit with Monaghan. I'm looking at a couple of opportunities um, now in, in kind of different different fields, and I'm I'm obviously going to uh, make a decision on that now in the next week or two. So I, I'm kind of I've been open to suggestions, and I've got a couple of interesting offers on the table, and I'm I'm just looking forward to to getting started in in a new role. So I should know more in the next week or two about that. And uh, but look, I, I'll I'll still be keeping a keen eye on the uh, on. On football and obviously with Dundalk and Sligo in the first game of the season, I won't know who to shout for. So it should be <laughs> should be good. Well, uh, thanks very much for coming on, Gary. Again, um, I, as I said earlier on, everyone I spoke to today, you're very very fondly remembered in Sligo, and I think that goes for everywhere in the League of Ireland. Thanks very much for coming on. We might try and get you back on closer to the the start up of the the Airtricity League and get your predictions for the season ahead. No problem, Mark. Pleasure. Thanks. Thanks very much, Gary. No worries.